uh, what people have been saying over history. Christ seems bigger than our understanding of him. Albert Schweizer said Christ was the bringer of eschatological hope, but Christ is bigger than this. For Boltman, but Christ is bigger than this. I agree with Niebuhr that Christ is bigger than our conceptual framework. What I can say is that if I fail to take the totality of the New Testament seriously, then my view of Christ will be small. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hi, brother. Are you all right? Yeah, I've just given a lecture, mate. Oh, nice. You know, are you <laughs> you're busy. No, it's okay. Are you okay, mate? Yeah, I'm great, yeah. Yeah. I've got this Bible study thing here. Yeah. I don't have anxiety. Last week, you know, with that cell group. Yeah, yeah. And see what you think of it. Yeah, we we can. Do, do you want to do that then for a bit, and then I'll get on with the lecture. Yeah. All right. It's just uh, Luke twelve. Yeah, right, it's recorded. Is that all right, Mark? Yeah. All right. Mate. Turn to Luke twelve. <coughs> <coughs> I'm just speaking quiet because the. They're all in bed and I don't want to wake them up. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Just saying, those who are going to be listening, uh, this is a, a colleague of mine who's going into the Anglican ministry and he's going to give us a Bible study. And then we'll get on with the lecture. Thank you. Go on, Mark. So it's Luke 12, verses 22 to 34. This is Jesus speaking. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field, and tomorrow was thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? or you have little faith. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows what you need, that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have, and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, as, as a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The question is, how, as Christians, can we cope with anxiety and worry? Mm. And John MacArthur, the preacher, says that this passage here that we've just read mm. basically tells us that when we're in the kingdom of God, mm. we can expect an anxiety-free life. Mm. And so there's some steps, there's four steps we can remember as Christians about how we can live. Mm. an anxiety free life and the first one is trust in God which I'll talk about a bit the second one is remembering God's provision and priority the third is reflect on God's character and his love for you and the fourth one is understand God's pleasure towards you and he says, <laughs> says 
the world offers medication to control anxiety and stress management. The best the world can offer is to manage or medicate anxiety. And then he says this, this is the most indulged, the most lavish society ever. This is the most comfortable society ever. This is the society that has the most, but it seems to be the most angst-ridden, anxious, stressed out and panic culture ever. We have a massive medical world that exists to do nothing but to help people with stress. No worry goes unnamed, no worry goes undefined, no worry goes uncatalogued, no worry goes undiagnosed, and no worry goes unmediated. They just go unrelieved. People live with anxiety, they live with worry, they live with stress. But it's so common that we don't even talk about eliminating it. The term is to manage it. So God doesn't want anxiety ruin our life. And uh, he talks about not worrying. He talks about how um, God feeds the birds mm. and clothes nature. Mm. Mm. You know, people worry your day about food about fashion, yeah. you know, they become eating machines or mannequins. Uh, many people today are not living life, they're actually just surviving. Yeah. It's to get through the week, to, to get the, the payday so they can get out. Yeah. Um, but Jesus says here, don't worry, don't do it. Now, the answer is given, it sounds... Um, a little naive, but he says, study nature. Yeah. And it says in the Bible, fear not, more than 365 times. That's yeah. one th for each day. Yeah. You know, Jesus is not given breathing techniques, or he doesn't tell people to, you know, do yoga. He just says, doesn't, don't do it. Yeah. And the passage, it's about where our heart is. You know, if, we, if our heart is in the world, we're going to live under, power, under the power of the world system, which breeds anxiety. Yeah. If our heart is in the kingdom, we will live under the power of the kingdom system, yeah. which is righteousness, joy and peace. Yeah. Yeah. Bill Johnson, the author, said this. He says, our refusal to fear reminds the devil that he is finished. And this may really sound a bit harsh. Yeah. But worry comes through ignorance <laughs> or unbelief about what God has said in his word. Wow, yeah. So people are anxious because, number one, the ignorance of what God says about it. Yeah. Or number two, they do know and they have unbelief. Oh. And they, they continue to worry. So Psalm 131 says this. So the first question is, how do we live an anxiety-free life? The first thing is, trust God. Mm. Psalm 131. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Mm. Surely I have calmed and quietened my soul like a winged child with his mother. Like a winged child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. Yeah. So it's about trusting God. Yeah. Trusting God. The second thing is, remember God's provision and priority. God is a God who provides. Yeah. When God's ruling our life, we can expect him to supply everything we need. What you were telling me today. Yeah. God's priority is that we keep focused on Jesus and bringing the kingdom rule to other people's lives. Yeah. Basically, the kingdom of God is the rule of God in the world. Yeah. The rule of Jesus. You know, people become what they focus on. Yeah, yeah. If they focus on worry, they'll worry. Yeah. If they yeah. Be, if they focus on on um, on wanting money all the time. 
that become money orientated. Yeah, yeah. But the answer is to focus on Jesus. We become what we focus on. Wow. No, so the, the second thing is we've got to remind ourselves that God is our provision and our priority. Mm. The third one is understand God's pleasure towards you. I think this is amazing. In Luke 12, 32, it says these words. It says, Do not fear. There's that command. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to to give you the kingdom. Yeah. He's saying it's it's God's good pleasure to give you his rule. Yeah. God delights when he's ruling in people's lives and hearts and minds. Yeah. Yeah. And then we ask we have got to ask, well the ki- what is the kingdom of God? You know, it tells us that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. Yeah. But of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's from Romans. Yeah. So God is saying, I delight in giving you righteousness. I delight in giving you peace. I delight in giving you joy. Yeah, yeah. When God and Christ is ruling our lives, we can expect to have peace and joy. Yeah. And um, righteousness. Now, anxiety comes because we think we're going to lose something we need in order to be happy. Uh. So, how do we cope with anxiety? One, we trust God. Two, we remember God's provision and priority. Three, we understand God's pleasure towards us. And the fourth one Uh. is... Reflect on God's character and his love for you. Uh. Reflect on God's character and his love for you. Psalm 145. Yeah. (coughs) Psalm 145. Yeah. Yeah. Psalm 145, verse 8. Now this is something to think about. Because there's a question after it. It says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Uh, That is a definition into the nature of God. uh, It's a scripture about the nature of God. It tells us he's gracious, full of compassion. Slow to anger, great in mercy, good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. That's five things. Gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, great in mercy, good to all. Sorry, six, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Uh. We've got to ask ourselves this question. Do our feelings match these truths? match these truths of God's nature. Mm. So how we feel about our, about God and ourselves, yeah. are they in line with that revelation of God's nature? Because yeah. I think God wants our feelings and our emotions to be in line with who, who he says he is, yeah. his character. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's amazing, mate. Uh, Psalm 139 yeah. says this, 1-18, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and rising up. You understand my thoughts are far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me in behind and before and laid your hand upon me. 
Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you. But the night shines as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed me in my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skilfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance before, yet unformed, and in your book all my days were written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Yeah. That's just basically saying God knows us. Yeah. God knows you. God knows me. Yeah. The question is, how do we feel with the thought that God knows all about us? Yeah. Do you know that God loves us the same as he loved Jesus? Yeah. John seventeen twenty three says this. This is an amazing scripture, this brother. John seventeen twenty three. This is when he's praying for the believers. Yeah. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. In another translation it says this, you know, it says that you have sent me and have loved them the same as you loved me. Mm. Yeah. So there's great definitions of that scripture saying, you know, God, there's a revelation that God loves me and you the same way he loves Jesus. His love is no less for you or for me than it was for Jesus. Wow, that's amazing, mate. So I was just thinking about this again. Is it possible for our feelings to be in line with the truth of God's nature and how he feels about us? Go back to that psalm, that uh, 139. Yeah. The whole... That, that, that talks about you search me and know me. You know, that psalm, it speaks of God's omnipotence. Yeah. It shows us God's all-powerful. He knows all about us. Yeah. It talks about his omnipresence. That is, he's there. Yeah. It talks about his, uh, <laughs> his nature of being all good. Is it benevolent, his goodness? Yeah. Uh, omniscient is all knowing. So the whole that that psalm tells us two things. That psalm one three nine it tells us God knows us, but it also tells us all about God. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like looking in a mirror. Yeah. Which is good. So just thinking about that, um, is it possible that our feelings? And I was thinking, mm. because I was, I was feeling and I was thinking with impact our actions. Yeah, yeah. Our feelings need to be in line and our behaviour with the nature of God. Yeah, yeah. Which is slow to anger. And just the last one, last scripture, I'm finished now. Philippians yeah. 4 6. <clears throat> says be anxious for nothing 
but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Question is, are we experiencing God's peace? Uh. Because there's conditions, it says, be anxious for nothing. Yeah. And then he says, in everything by prayer and supplication. So it's saying, don't be anxious. It says, come to God in prayer with your supplications, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. So prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Yeah. Make your requests known to God. And when you do that, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Mm. So again, there's a promise of peace from from um, from God. So just just going back to what we said at the beginning, the summary of Luke twelve twenty two to thirty four. Is in this teaching of Luke 12, 22 to 34, and other passages of scripture oh. dealing with fear and anxiety. The issue is this when we are part of the kingdom of God, oh. we can have anxiety, anxiety free living. Oh. And that's a reality. And to help us get that revelation in our mind, we've got to trust God. We've got to remember God's provision and priority is promised to meet our needs. We've got to understand God's pleasure towards us. He's, he's pleased to give us his rule, his kingdom. He's pleased to give us his, his joy, yeah. his patience, his righteousness. And the last one is to reflect on God's character and his love for us. Yeah. And especially Psalm one four five, which says the Lord is slow to anger, yeah. full of compassion, and we've got to remember that God, God has more patience with us than we have with ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we can be hard on ourselves; we can be hard on ourselves than God is. Yeah, yeah. So that's it, brother. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant, mate. That's really topped me up, that, mate. I feel refreshed and encouraged. Praise God. That was really good. Yeah. So what's your lecture on, then? Christ and culture, mate. Oh, Christ and culture. Are you, are you on YouTube now, like? Yeah, we're on YouTube, yeah. Shall I go to YouTube? Uh, I'll, put, I'll listen to it if you want. Yeah, you can listen to it here if you want. Yeah, I'll just I'll 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 just lecture here and I'll stop after two pages and let you say something, mate. Yeah, that'll be that'll be great, Chief. Is that all right? Yeah. I'll just say two pages, stop, and let you argue back or say what you want. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, that Bible study was brilliant, mate. Cheers, bud. It was a real blessing. All right. Um. This lecture, uh, I want to thank Mark for his Bible study. Uh, that was a friend, dear friend of mine, a uh, brother in Christ, who's um, we're, we've been uh, together in in uh, seminary and we've been encouraging each other. And that Bible study was a real encouragement. I hope you was encouraged by that. And it does tails into looking at Christ and culture. And so I'm going to give a lecture, and then Mark's going to. Just tell us what he thinks and give us his, his ideas. Um, first of all, what do we mean by Christ and culture? First, I need to define what I mean by Christ. The understanding of Christ I have will affect my understanding of culture. There are some basic lines of, lines of thought here. I must realize that Christ has influenced history. I must see how Christ has been received negatively and positively, positively throughout history. All these statements will show that various ideas don't fully comprehend him. Albert Schweizer said Christ was the bringer of eschatological hope, but Christ is bigger than this. For Boltman, Christ was the existential preacher, but Christ is bigger than this. 
I agree with Niebuhr that Christ is bigger than our conceptual framework. What I can say is that if I fail to take the totality of the New Testament seriously, then my view of Christ will be small. At the very least, this New Testament evidence points to an objective being who claimed to be the Son of God. Quote, the power and attraction of Jesus Christ exercises over men never comes from him alone, but from him as Son of the Father. It comes from him in his sonship in a double way, a man living to God and God living with men. Belief in him and loyalty to his courts involves man in the double movement from world to God and from God to world. End of quote, Niebuhr, page 29. What do I mean by culture? Niebuhr has said that culture is the artificial secondary environment. He also thought culture was a social heritage and has values. So because culture has values, it has to be interpreted with this in mind. I think this is good, but it needs more detail. Does mass culture, for example, mean the same as culture generally? The other point that needs to be made is Niebuhr lacks the conceptual tools to critique culture. Marxism, the Frankfurt School, and semiology have much deeper conceptual tools. Uh, I need to take some of the modern views of culture into my definition. Van Hooser might be a Valpier. He thinks culture is a performance of one's values. He thinks culture is a stage where individuals act on their parts. Van Hoover then starts to break down his definition. He asks, where do the values come from which shape culture? He thinks the values come from people who must believe their myths or see a pragmatic use in them, even if they do not believe. This means for Van Hooser that all cu culture is simply the product of myth-making and the public affirmation of their myths. He finally points out that there is an underlying structure to all myth making. Quote, At the heart of society or civilization is a narrative, some story or history or drama, which accounts for its origin and destiny, which enshrines and grounds its system of values. Every culture tells its story, its past, its future in a particular way that gives it a sense of direction and a means of understanding itself. So I'll stop there. That's the first two pages. So, any thoughts, mate? Yeah, I was just thinking about cultures, and obviously, um, the Jesus of Britain, of we know in Britain and um, America. Yeah, yeah. Has been a West, a Western understanding of Jesus. Yeah. Which you know is Western culture being based on rationalism. Yeah, yeah. Reason. And then per perical uh, evidences. How you think about Jesus? Yeah, yeah. But well, in the Eastern culture, you know, that's more focused on mysticism or feeling or nature. Mm. So I think when we talk about uh, Jesus, yeah, yeah, Christ in culture, we've got to remember it's not just the Christ of Western culture. What, we know what the Christ, we might know what the Christ of Western culture is like. We might relate to the Christ of Western culture. Yeah, yeah. But what's the what's the Christ of Eastern culture like? Yeah, yeah. And with you know Jesus being a Jew in his historical context. Yeah. You know, was Israel's it's it's more closer to the East, like the Eastern worldview. Yeah, yeah. So that's just my thoughts on that. But he, like you say, you know, he transcends all cultures, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's brilliant, mate. Because uh, because of what you said there, I'll, I'll just leave it there. The next part is Christ against culture. This view believes that Christ is the sole authority of the disciple. For example, Matthew chapter five twenty one, uh, forty eight chapter Matthew chapter five seventeen twenty and Matthew chapter 23 1 to 3 this is backed up by 1 John 3 23 so I'll just look at that 1 John 3 23 <coughs> 1 John uh, 3 23 and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son of Jesus Christ and love one another as he give us commandment this voice points to the faith in Christ as being the most important in a person's life. The Christ against culture also 
has a low view of the world. This is brought out in the text such as 1 John 2.15. Here the disciple is taught not to love the world, but also the world is said to be under Satan's authority in 1 John 5.19. This view has a high view of eternity and a low view of temporal time. For you see the world is passing away, 1 John 2.17. Finally, this view sees the world as an enemy. The world is to be overcome. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, 1 John 5, 4. Other Christian books teach similar things. The Shepherd of Hermes and the First Epistle of Clement teach that the Christian life is to be separate from the world. These early Christian writers also thought that they were, people, that they were a people established, uh, established by God, the lawgiver. This view of Christ against culture can be seen throughout church history. Tertullian believed that Christians should be separate from the world. He put a, pan, a ban on Christians joining the army. He saw politics as a place to be shunned. He made a list of many occupations which he thought Christians must avoid. Tertullian did say that Christians should try and work in society, but he was in the main generally against culture. Tolstoy, the 19th century writer, was another who held to the Christ against culture. He saw Jesus as a lawgiver. He thought culture was evil. Tolstoy also saw no good thing in the church or government. He hated the life of the rich and the scholar, but he wanted to get back to the simple life of the peasant. One thing about Tolstoy, he tried to do good in the world by speaking out against injustice. Quote, it was in 1908 that Tolstoy most sensational article appeared I cannot be silent the entire Russian population knew about it for it was passed around by word of mouth and circulars school children neglected their Latin grammar to learn it by heart in it Tolstoy denounced the death sentence and almost daily executions which were taking place in Russia and of quote uh, Hoffman to page 228 one thing I, I like about this view and I think is relevant today is that it tries to bring absolutes into culture. I think Christianity can lose some of its traction if its moral teaching does not challenge the thinking of culture. If the two are equal then it could neutralize Christianic, Christianity. Tillich warns against this, quote, the relationship between religion and culture must be defined from, from both sides of the boundary. Religion cannot relinquish the absolute and therefore universal claims that it expressed in the idea of God. It cannot allow itself to become special area with culture or to a position beside culture. End of quote, Tillich, page 69. But this view has some problems. Tertullian and Tolstoy might reject culture, but they still use culture. Tertullian used his lawyer's training in his theology. Tolstoy still lived on his farm even if he handed the running of it to his wife. Also when one culture is rejected it often leads to setting up another similar culture. For, exa for example the monks rejected the church and state but the monasteries became mini towns with similar structures to the world. So that's, that's the first main view. We're looking at different views on Christ and culture. That, that's Christ against culture. So I don't yeah. know what you thought about. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I was just thinking about... Um, it's good to remember that like, when you talk about cultures, whatever, like, whatever you think about culture, yeah. where it says in Ephesians, our fight not against flesh and blood, but the spiritual powers that, can, that control the culture. Yeah, yeah. Um... I was just thinking about the false gospel, the prosperity gospel. Yeah, yeah. Which is actually, it's the opposite of being against culture, it's actually for it. Yeah. You know, it's a reversal of First John. First John says, do not love the, it talks about loving the world, the flesh and the devil. Yeah, yeah. And it actually reverses that. Because the unregenerate person, it, the unregenerate person uh, loves the world, loves the flesh, yeah. and sort of is controlled by the devil. Yeah, yeah. So the prosperity gospel, in a sense, it, it gives unregenerate people what, what they want. Yeah, yeah. 
the promises Christians were unregenerate people once. Yeah, yeah. You know, so there's actually some gospels. What I'm trying to say is there's some gospels that um, that are actually um, wouldn't, wouldn't be seen as against the culture, but sort of embracing it. Yeah. Where th their brand of Christianity is the culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you, do you think uh, two questions? Um, where do, where does where does Christianity challenge culture, and where does Christianity fit into culture? I think the the the, be the best answer for that is thinking about the teaching of the Beatitudes. Yeah. You know, that was Jesus' vision for, for Christian discipleship in the world. Yeah, yeah. It was a taste of, it was a taste of, um, it, it was a taste of, I think, the, the vision of what, what's to come in the future. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think the biggest challenge, yeah, I think if Christians actually took that teaching more seriously, yeah, yeah. You know, um, maybe there'd be a bit like a better testimony to to the world and that's countercultural. Yeah. Well, this is what I was just thinking about when um, even like preachers, you know, will preach the gospel, Jay. Yeah. Like um, there's ve there's very few there's there's very few preachers that that take that. Um, text seriously where Jesus talks about where he says to the man you know um, li, li, give up all you have yeah. sell all you have and come and follow me yeah. there's very few Christians I know that actually take that seriously yeah yeah which is um, which is strange so I don't know I think I'm waffling a bit now bro uh, <laughs> second bit Next bit, Christ of culture. This view sees no problem between Christ and culture. This view is a positive to Christ and culture. It always been characterized by training people to work in the world for a new social order. Some of the exponents of this view were Gnostics. It was Bal uh, the Basleda and Valentius who started the idea that Christianity ne needed to be saved from its outmoded Jewish cultural setting. From this, they wanted to make Christianity to accept, acceptable to the world. This would further be achieved by bringing Christianity up to date with the received knowledge of the day. Uh, Niebuhr, page 86. They also had the idea that Jesus was lawgiver but not Lord. They saw Christ as the pinnacle of human achievement. They saw Christianity as a religion. As for ethics, well, they did not like Christian ethics. Others who held this view of Christ's culture are Abelard, Schleimacher, Ritual. Ritual saw man's biggest problem as his struggle with nature. He had a doctrine of the brotherhood of man and used the kingdom of God language to teach it. The good thing about this view is it tries to understand Christianity in the light of, of present knowledge. This surely can only be a good thing. Psychology, philosophy, sociology does not stand still and new discoveries are made all the time. If Christians put their heads in the sand, they'll be seen as obscurantist fools. Also, their faith will be poorer because the knowledge we gain could enlighten our walk with God. For example, the above disciplines have to have come to realize that being you, human is relational. This knowledge affects our Christian faith and witness in many ways. But this view of Christ of culture has negative also. Niebuhr warns it does not mean it is the best method in evangelism. Niebuhr also says it has a tendency to make Christ in its own image. It has produced many fanciful lives of Jesus. Also, I would say this view has a tendency to put the intellectual above the transcendent. It is far, far too confident of itself and in human achievement. The following statement is an example of overconfidence which two world wars have smashed so that such liberalism should be a little more humble today. Quote, liberal Protestantism is thus, as its name implies, a religion of spiritual freedom. 
It rose and has grown with liberalism and tolerance, those exquisite flowers of high mental culture, efflorescence of the human soul, the harbingers of spiritual progress, wherever they flourish. Uh, that wasn't a good quote. That I was meant to show it was a show it show it in a bad light. Yeah. Um, basically, um, um, often this idea of culture trying to mix in uh, Christianity mixing in with culture has often led. Uh, liberal Protestantism to, to create a God in its own image really mm. rather than actually create a God of the scripture or, or teach a God of the scripture yeah so it's open for discussion I don't necessarily agree with everything I've said it's just it's just to stimulate thought so yeah well I was just when you were talking about the, the Christ of culture there Jay yeah yeah, it just uh, it just seemed to me that's what contemporary Christianity is today. Yeah, yeah. It's so trying to be like the world to reach the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you ask if you ask a lot of people, um, in churches that are trying to reach reach the lost and that. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of the big churches now they have like uh, they might have rap music or big screens to get people in the church and. What this says, you know, we're we're trying to make Jesus relevant. Yeah. And you can un you can understand that in one sense, but you know the reality is Jesus is relevant whether people realise it or not. Yeah, yeah. We don't make Jesus relevant. He is he is relevant. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's crazy. And um and this is why you sometimes you get these watered down, seeker friendly yeah, yeah. Messages and that. Yeah. I think one preacher said this. He says we've got to use seeker-friendly methods to reach the lost, but not seeker-friendly messages. <laughs> so by by the method he meant, you know, it, it's all right if you want to be the the Christ of culture. It's it's all right, um, you know, having big screens in the church and stuff like that. And yeah, yeah. And, and using media and communication yeah. in a way that the younger generation understand, but the the message of Christ has to be the same. Yeah, yeah. Down what are the message down? That's brilliant. Yeah. All right, fourth section. Uh, Christ above culture. This view sees that obedience to Christ is vital, but it must be in in the natural order. It sees culture as important as it can help humanity, for example, education. Christians of this view see grace as primary, but works of obedience are also important. This view sees the visible order as a place to express God's grace. One famous person who held to this view was the great Thomas Aquinas. He believed that the church had the role of guarding culture. Reason was also important for Aquinas here. For him, reason was the method which ruled culture. Joseph Butler, the 17th century Anglican bishop, was another famous Christian who held to this view. One of the good things about this view is that it, is that it does lead to help humanity practically. If you see that culture has good things to offer, then the church can use culture to, to benefit society. This can be seen as I looked at Father Damien's ministry. He was a Catholic priest sent to Hawaii in May 1864 to reach and minister to the leper colony. He found that the authorities had left the lepers to do as they wish, which means these poor folk were living as dogs. Father Damien soon got to work. He built a water system so the lepers could have fresh water. He also read medical books and used the knowledge to help the lepers. In short, he used many aspects of culture to make the lepers live much better. Here are some more examples of what can be achieved with this Christ above culture. Quote, he decorated it so that it would be cheerful and appeal to the congregation. This was something of a shock to Europeans. One of the Franciscan sisters, who later joined Damien on Moke Island, said it looked like a, a Chinese shop, the church. He also made the mass as ceremonial as possible. He wanted everyone to feel involved and uplifted. He formed various associations, choirs, 
uh, which became quite famous and an orchestra the orchestra played very well despite the fact that the musicians had fought for the most part only two or three fingers and their lips were very much swollen these are the leopard this is the leopard colony that he got to to do these things choirs and stuff like that end of quote one of the difficulties of this Christ above culture is that it can some that it can come across as morally superior if we as Christians don't do practical things in the world but instead pronounce to the world that one would that one could be guilty of being a spiritual snob also it came it can come across as if the church is somehow perfect without fault I have found this to be with Newman he regards the church as somehow a perfect beacon to the world and the world as a mass of rubbish needing to be cleaned up if he gets that sometimes it is the world who guides the church in the right path was it a Christian who brought freedom to woman or the feminist here's an example of Newman's approach which I don't accept quote in these later days are like ma in like manner outside the Catholic Church things are tending with far greater rapidity than in that old time from the circumstances of the age to atheism in one shape or another lovers of their country and of their race religious men external to the Catholic Church have attended various expedients to arrest fear fierce willful human nature in its onward course and to bring it into subjection end of quote I don't agree with what I've said like but <laughs> just some thoughts yeah I was just thinking there about Christ above culture I think it was true what he said about there's a danger like you know like snobbery yeah where you get to the point where you think you can't learn from unbelievers yeah yeah I mean I was like that years ago I thought you know I'm in the light there in the dark you know I can't learn nothing from them and you know God does teach you yeah yeah God teaches you through the atheists you know yourself and yeah and stuff like that it teaches you um, but I think the world has sorry I think the church yeah has followed the world more than it claims I remember that scripture series by John McCart the sufficiency of scripture yeah where he talks about all the, all the fads that come into secular culture yeah and he said he, he says the uh, when the world gives up on them the church takes over and he talked about it, it, it's the church jumps on the bandwagon just at the time it's slowing down <laughs> which is when the world you know finds these new ideas and psychologies and philosophies yeah it writes them off and then what the church is is it picks them up <laughs> yeah. so so when something novel comes into the world yeah the church is the, is the first to start condemning it yeah well then it sort of embraced it. It's like when the Beatles came on the scene in the 60s. You know, the church in America went crazy. Yeah. And um, John Lennon made a quote. He said, you know, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And he wasn't like being blasphemous. He was just, he was stating the fact that people seemed more interested. The church was so irrelevant. Yeah. That people were more interested in the Beatles and what the Beatles had to say about things. And then, well, that's what happened. They spoke out against him. They said the new, you know, the music's all of the devil. And they all burned the oldest records and all, of, and the Bob Dylan records. Yeah. And what they're doing is, twenty years later, they're, they're actually Bring turning it. the Beatles songs into Christian songs, and the church is full of it now. Yeah, yeah. So the church are like rock and roll arenas. Yeah, yeah. You know, people don't. Even, now it's a, it's a gross sin if a church has an organ. <laughs> you sing old hymn, it's like the worst sin ever. <laughs> it's true, mate. <laughs> that's that's because it's given to the culture. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome, mate. All right, that was brilliant. Christ in culture in paradox. I think this is the. Uh, and then we got one more and then that's then a conclusion uh, this view advocates this is Christ in culture in paradox this view advocates a loyalty to Christ and feels a responsibility to culture it also sees a conflict between man's righteousness and God's righteousness 
In this view, grace is seen as the main source of control in a person's life. This view also sees culture as needing grace as it is affected by sin. This view is dualistic. It sees culture as damaged and going astray. It uses law to keep culture on track. The Apostle Paul might advocate this view. He regarded God as absolute and culture as relative, Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, we see also Paul's view that culture is subject to God's redemptive purposes. Martian was one of the great followers and expander of this view. He believed God created matter, but it was damaged. Scholars such as Harnack believed Marnack was a Paulinist. Martian had a high view of revelation of God's goodness and mercy, but did not like the Old Testament view of God's wrath. He also could not accept the injustice mankind had to endure in this world. He saw people as stupid, bad, and even vermin. Marcion just could not accept that a good God could create such a world. At the end of the day, the world was a tragic mistake. So what was Marcion's solution? First, Marcion taught that humanity was led by two gods, a just God who was limited even though he, was, he created the world, and then there was the good God who, through Christ, would rescue mankind out of matter. Marcion's ethics were interesting. He believed in an ethic of justice and love, but he saw them as bound up with corruption. Marcion's agenda was to draw Christians into a physical Christianity, a sort of gathered community. This view, um, this experience is shared by many Christians in that of being pulled by God and the world in different directions. Many Christians feel, can feel this in, in attention. Surely to ignore it is to bring spiritual damage to people who need some encouragement. Also, to ignore this inattention is to ignore the tremendous spiritual power the world does have on our journey with God. The problem with this view are twofold. One is the view uh, is its view that all humanities achieve in terms. Sorry, this problem with with this view might be twofold. One is that all you human all that humans achieve in terms of moral law is simply sinful, at least to people ignoring those laws. This is Niebuhr's thought. I can't see it myself, but it might be a possibility. I think a better objection, as it can give Christians, Christians an inferiority complex. What I mean is, although this view has a sense of responsibility to culture, with its inherent view of tension in the world, it feels a need to be apologetic about its achievements. One has found this in evangelical scholarship. For over a hundred of years, Evangelicals have felt that they had to apologize for their scholarly achievements. But whoever we are, we should be proud of what we achieve in Christ. Quote, there is a need for evangelicalism to take time to set out its own ideas without feeling the need to keep looking over its collective shoulder. Being placed on the defensive forces evangel evangelicalism into a reactive posture. In this volume, I have decided not to adopt such a position. Instead, I propose to set out the coherence of the evangelical vision of theology and engage critically with its contemporary revival rivals. End of quote. Uh, McGrath, page 21. Any thoughts? So it's a uh, Christ in culture in paradox, um, a kind of tension that we're in the world, but we're not of the world and stuff I don't know any thoughts yeah. well I was just thinking about th t terms have changed so much now Jay yeah yeah it's hard to even define what an evangelical is anymore yeah yeah I mean 50 years ago there was probably a definition of what an evangelical was and everybody agreed with it yeah yeah. Now, there's probably so many different definitions of what an evangelical is. Yeah. So you know. Um, do you think? Do you think? Basically, there's a theological fracture where it's become the words become nebulous. Doesn't really mean anything anymore. I do. Yeah. I do. Well, people are using the term post-evangelical now, aren't they? Well, what does that what does that mean? I'm not really sure. Um, 
But they, but it's interesting though if they're using the word post evangelical. So like you said, years ago, when the word evangelical was being used, like in the fifties, there was a it was very clear, even if you were in the Lloyd Jones camp or the John Stock camp or the Billy Graham camp, everybody knew what, where you were at. Um, but like today, like you said, uh, um, it's more like tribes now, isn't it? There are different tribes and a lot of the tribes it's very nebulous and you don't know where they're at theologically what they mean by evangelical and those who do define evangelicalism <coughs> are defining it in such a rigid way i.e. the reformed Calvinistic yeah you know so so how does one Maintain one's uh, your uh, theological identity. Um, uh, and live with that tension in the world. I, I, I um, there's a there's a church not far away. It's a very well known church in in Arpahe, and uh, it's an Anglican church. Uh, yeah. About, 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, it had loads of activities. It had a choir, drama group, woman's group, everything. And this mm. evangelical minister came and he closed everything down. He just, well, closed, right. he just closed everything and said, no, we're just having the preaching of the word and the prayer meeting. Yeah. And people went mad and they had... Um, they, they they had to preach in the the prayer meeting and the the church grew and it was blessed. Yeah. But I've heard stories of other people at that time who were who were like like that who became bitter and twisted because they were fighting the world and they were they were um, you know they were trying to bring in the gospel and and change the church and change the area but they were always in tension with the world so. Yeah. I don't know. Can I just read this to you, Jay? Yeah. It's Bishop Rao. He answers the question, what the evangelical religion is. Yeah. So he say, he defines evangelicalism as this. He says, the simple answer I can give is to point out what appear to be its leading features. These I consider to be five in number. So he defines evangelical religion as one. The first leading feature in the evangelical religion is the absolute supremacy it assigns to Holy Scripture. As the only rule of faith and practice, the only test of truth, the only judge of controversy. Its theory is that man is required to believe nothing as necessary to salvation, which is not read in God's written word or can be proved thereby. It totally denies that there is any other guide for man's soul, co-equal or coordinate with the Bible. It refuses to listen to such arguments as the Church says so, the Father says so, primitive antiquity says so, Catholic tradition says so, the Council says so, the ancient liturgy says so, the prayer book says so. The universal conscience of mankind says so. Unless it can be shown that what is said is in harmony with the scripture, the supreme authority of the Bible in one word is one of the cornerstones of our system. Shows anything plainly written in that book and however trying to flesh and blood we will receive it, believe it and submit to it. Show anything as religion which is contrary to that book we will not haze it at any price. It may come before us endorsed by fathers, schoolmen and Catholic writers. It may be commended by reason, philosophy, science and the inner light. The universal conscience of mankind, it signifies nothing. Give us rather a few plain texts. If the thing is not in the Bible, 
or in manifest harmony with the Bible, we will have none of it. Like the forbidden fruit, we dare not touch it lest we die. Our faith can find no resting place except in the Bible or in Bible arguments. Here is rock, all else is sand. So that's the first thing he says. Wow. That's awesome. He says the sec he says the second leading feature in evangelical religion is the depth and prominence it assigns to the doctrine of human sinfulness and corruption. And then he goes on, he says, the third leading feature of evangelical religion is the paramount importance it attaches to the work and office of our Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and to the nature of the salvation which he has wrought out for man. Yeah. So that's the third. He says, the fourth leading feature in evangelical religion is the high place which it assigns to the inward work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of man. And he says the fifth and last leading feature in evangelical religion is the importance which it attaches to the outward and visible work of the Holy Ghost in the life of man. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, if you, you'll get people who come along today at the post-evangelicals Oh. Who maybe who were for gay marriage, yeah. But would say they agree with those five categories there. Yeah. But they couldn't do good there because they, no. they'd, be, they'd be breaking the first one, wouldn't <laughs> they? Which is the um, yeah, I know it's amazing, mate. Yeah, the the, the absolute supremacy of science holy scripture. Yeah, they actually think Alistair McGrath. He defines evangelicalism. I've got it written in my diary somewhere. And I think he's he think he's got that off him because he, he, he puts Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he actually funny enough, he, he he adds the church to it as well. Yeah. Six one. You know, fellowship within the church. Wow. Whereas that means he's going ecumenical, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Whereas he doesn't. That's so, right. Alright, I'll I've got two two more bits that shouldn't be long now. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, this is the last one, last the last model, I think. Okay, it's uh, Christ, the transformer of culture. This view is conversionist, but similar to the Jewish position. This view does not reject institutions. It does believe humanity is under judgment, but still it seeks to work in culture. Here the creation theme is important. It neither overpowers or is mastered by the atonement theme. This view sees the work of the incarnation as just as important as the work of the cross. It also sees man's state as corrupted but not bad. It believes that Jesus can transform culture. It sees the flesh as not evil. The Gospel of John teaches all this, for example, in John 3.16, uh, the universal love of God. Augustine says Niebuhr is an example of this view of Christ, the transformer of culture. For example, he used language to propagate the gospel. Uh, Niebuhr explains more, quote, Christ is the transformer of culture for Augustine in the sense that he directs, reinvigorates and regenerates the life of man expressed in all human works, which in present actuality and corrupted exercise of a fundamentally good nature which moreover in its depravity lies under the curse of transiency and death, not because it is intrinsically self-contradictory, end of quote. That was a mouthful. The other great theologian who comes in this stream is F.D. Morris. He believed Christ comes into the world as king. He also thought Jesus was Lord of not just the church but all mankind. Even if men believed this or not, it was still true. Morris also felt that humanity was a social organism. He believed that the individualistic piety of the day failed to take into is into into sorry. Um, he believed that individualistic piety of the day failed to take this into account. Because of this, Morris thought that it was only in community that a person can truly find oneself. Finally, Morris believed in universal salvation. This view 
has some interesting points. With such a positive understanding of creation, it encourages people to use their talents and celebrate life. It means a painter or a musician should not feel guilty if that person wishes to express themselves and explore the world around them. This view also helps the church to realize not only is the soul important, but the whole human body, the whole man needs healing. If people realize this, it can lead to a more creative forms of ministry. For example, counseling um, for, for ministers who want to use it. <laughs> One church in Japan has already been doing this type of ministry. Quote, before long, Navo knew he must train more Christian counselors or else he would be completely swamped with people wanting to tension. So the, so the total in, so the total counseling school was officially launched in 1986, with Mrs. Yuko Wantabe eventually taking charge of the nationwide series of counselors training seminars. Nabavo had a compassion for the many Christians throughout Japan who were indeed saved but were still hurting because of unresolved inner conflicts complexities and fears. He now conducts counseling training seminars in 12 cities throughout Japan. Currently during one year about 2,000 Christians and non-Christians are enrolled for their seminars on four levels, learning to accept themselves and finding emotional healing." End of quote. Some problems arise with this view. First it seems to lack a doctrine of the church. It talks a lot about how Christ can transform culture, but it fails to show how this is achieved in practice even though Morris expresses the point that it's only a social unit that the individual can find him herself, he is not clear how this social organism is to help the situation. I think what is needed here is for his view to realize that Christ cannot transform, transform culture unless he, does it, unless he does it through the church. That means the church has not the ability herself but needs a greater power to help and that is Christ. This view cannot achieve its dreams unless it deals with Bart's point, the church as a creature needs power, then culture can be affected. Quote, the true community of Jesus Christ is the community which God has sent into the world and with its foundation. As such, it, it, it exists for the world. It does so not in virtue of any dignity, authority or power imminent to its creaturely nature as one people among others, but in virtue of the plenary power which is which it's invested and which is thus proper to it and in with its foundation as this people end of quote bar page 501 second secondly a further problem I have with this view is that it does obliterate any it does obliterate any distinction between the temporal and eternal quote uh, Bonhoeffer it may be difficult to break the spell of this thinking in terms of two spheres but it is nevertheless quite certain that it is profound contradiction to the thought of the Bible and the thought of the Reformation and consequently it aims wide off reality. There are two realities but only one reality. That is the reality of God which has become manifest in Christ in the reality of the world. Sharing Christ we stand once in the reality of God and the world." End of quote. The problem with this view and Bonhoeffer's statement is the reality is stated to be the absolute, which is the infinite, i.e. Uh, creation. If this is the case, it would be foolish to talk in terms of any antithesis language. Good and bad, heaven and hell, make no sense with Bonhoeffer's idea. If God and creation are but one reality, then it will affect the doctrine of evil. Man being creation, God being creation, then God will either be stated as having moral imperfection or imperfection will be seen as an illusion. This view causes more problems than it solves. It's a bit convoluted and complicated there. Um, but I think um, Niebuhr's a liberal and I don't agree with it, the way he interpreted um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Augustine. I think basically yeah. what I'm trying to say is, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, <laughs> I think it's like, so, uh, Maurice is like a socialist. Mm. Um, and basically he's, he's saying unless we, uh, the, the only hope for society 
is basically that individuals realize that the salvation is in community and that's what he's saying Morris um, so and I, I don't even though I've said you can use counseling I don't particularly agree with that so anyhow mm. it's a bit convoluted there Mark but have you got any thoughts mate it's a bit it's a bit um, it's a bit deep I was just thinking about sure so Christ the transformer of culture is he saying that's the correct vision then is that what his conclusion is no he was just he's just giving like five or six models but he is a like neo-orthodox kind of liberal kind of guy so he's he's he misunderstands some of the people that he's talking about like like Augustine but I think in this one he's, he's saying uh, I just he's saying that cult, I think he's saying that um, that human I think this position is saying that human beings are corrupt but they're not that bad they can be redeemed I think he's saying that and I think he's saying it's done socially so you so the counseling the whole point of counseling the whole point of Maurice for this view is that uh, the re, the way to bring healing to 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 people to culture mm -hmm. is to bring them together socially this is how you transform culture and and Christianity can help with that yeah kind of kind of like basically it's kind of like counseling where people counsel and get people to realize that inner goodness I think that's what it's saying you get people in together as a community and you get them to realize that inner goodness that's what he's saying yeah is he about a Christian community then or is he about just any community I think yeah I think he's hinting at Christian community um, Niebuhr and then uh, Maurice Roberts was definitely thinking that way I think Maurice Roberts was influenced by socialism but thinking, yeah. uh, thinking but using Christian language using his socialism but taking Christian language putting them together so when when socialists would talk about getting people together and, and giving them rights and stuff like that Morris to talk about uh, Christ's kingdom and we've got to be together in Christ's kingdom so, yeah uh, for me I think I think these like theological reflections are helpful in that they, they make you think but at the same time I think they're a bit wishy-washy because they because um, I think, f from my perspective, I mean, there are evangelicals. There, are, there are, like when we were at seminary, um, I thought I don't know what you thought, but I thought most of the people there thought about when they go into ministry, it was about transforming culture. Yeah, it was not about getting people saved and born again. That's my thought. And yeah. if you remember, yeah. if you remember Chris Culp, the lecturer. Oh yeah. <laughs> when he used to go on, you know, his whole agenda was to get people into the social gospel, wasn't it? Was that what his agenda was? I don't know. Was it, Jay? <laughs> yeah, that was his agenda. Oh, like... the, yeah, that was his agenda. Like when you looked at the way he set out the lectures and what he was trying to do. Yeah, I, you must be. I don't. You must be clever picking that up, Jim. I was just lost brother there. <laughs> you used to always say they used to put like little pills in them, didn't you? And every like, there's an agenda in every one, wasn't there? Yeah. Well, with Chris yeah. Paul, if you remember, he's, he <coughs> he um, he did. Um, oh, what's that? Uh, what's that European evangelical group called? Like major European evangelical group. Oh, I don't know. The, 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 the John Stott was involved in it years ago. Oh, right. Um, 
Well, there was a big. I can't remember. Uh, it'll come to me. But there was a big. In the fifties, there was it, with Billy Graham. There was the emphasis on preaching the gospel. Yeah. Oh yeah. But in the sixties, in the Anglican Church. Uh, and other churches, there was a big debate about we gotta we gotta do social work. We gotta get the church to be socially engaged. Well, that's what it's turned into, Jay. Now, to be honest. Yeah. You know, because you they're like social workers, brother. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and so like it, there was a big document written uh, in Europe amongst European evangelicals. And Chris Cope's whole course was built around that, trying to get you thinking about uh, the gospel and culture and uh, social action and stuff like that. And so basically, he was he, he was he was trying to encourage people to realise that the church had to to go out and do more creative ministries of of social transformation. And, yeah. and, and you know, and it was just as important as proclamation, but really deep down what what he he wanted was social transformation rather than gospel preaching yeah yeah um, I'll, I'll just read the last bit and then we can just talk about that because that that's I've got one or two things that are really important to say on that and I'll just read the last bit it's just conclusion I've defined Christ as an objective person who claimed to be the son of God I've taken general definition of culture by Niebuhr as the that artificial secondary environment and I've mixed this definition with Van Hoover's who saw culture as a process of myth making. I then looked at Christ against culture and I showed how its main loyalty was to Christ. How it has a low view of temporal as seen in 1 John 2.17. Here I looked at Tertullian and Tolstoy and pointed out how these people though they reject culture could not ignore it. Next I looked at Christ of culture view I showed how this view has positive outlook to both. I noted that this view often saw Christ as the pinnacle of human achievement and I did not like this ethic. Uh, I also pointed out that this view tries to harmonize present knowledge with Christianity and can be too confident of human autonomy. Next I looked at Christ above culture this view showed uh, I showed saw obedience to Christ in the world as importance. It had a positive view of culture, especially as an aid to humanitarian effort. It also conformed to the trap of a superior mental attitude. Then I looked at the Christ in culture in paradox. It was similar to Christ above view, but with an added twist, which was that it saw a real tension between believers and the world. I pointed out that the merit, that this mirrors a Christian experience and that it can lead to Christians feeling inferior in the world. Finally, I looked at Christ, the transformer of cultural view. This view sees creation as important and is not to be in, intimidated by atonement. Augustine and F.D. Morris were considered. I pointed out that Bath notes the church needs power from God to do its task. and The transformer view does not realize this. I finished pointed out how Bonhoeffer and this view destroy antithesis thinking, something I think could be dangerous in relation to the doctrine of evil. So which view is best for today? In one sense, it's hard to choose as they all have much to offer. I think the Christ against culture tends to st stick its head in the sand. I do, think, I, I, I do not think it's relevant to hide away from the world and watch it go by. As for the Christ of culture, it loses any force to me because it tends to build Christ in its own image. If I am to be relevant, I must be faithful to the New Testament witness and not mold the incarnation to fit my ideas. The Christ above culture is appealing. I like the humanitarianism as well as its commitment to Christ, but it seems to be lacking maybe a lack of realism in the first in the face of spiritual antagonism. This leads me to the Christ in culture in paradox. I like this because it has the Christ above you in it, but a little more. The more is a real sense of spiritual warfare. For all the benefits of Christ the Transformer culture view, it seems to be Christianity without any moral or spiritual backbone. I am moving more to Christ in culture in paradox. Does this paradox view accord with the Bible? I think it does, as fresh look at Paul will show. And um, I just do a little study on, on on that, but I'll leave that there. So, any thoughts, mate? I 
think there's um, I think there's bitter truth in all of them, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the go the gospel is it is it there's nuggets of the gospel in all of them. Yeah, yeah. And it's just bringing it all together as a whole, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, that's what I think. I think uh, the New Testament's bigger than any one model. Yeah. Um, I think. Um, I think I think what I get out of it is what I I always remember Doctor Rainey, <laughs> and he always used to say, "Make sure what you do is theologically based." And I think when you look today at our culture, it's in the church. It, it it's there's nothing. It's not rooted in theology at all. There's no theological reflection or or anything in the church mm. and. Um, Generally speaking, not not everywhere, but generally. And when you look at our history, when you look at um, uh, what's his name, Irenaeus, how he dealt, mm. deals with the Gnostics and the issue of culture there, it's all scriptural. When he's grappling with scripture, and you look at Augustine, you look at all these great theologians, and they're all they're all grappling with the Bible and trying to relate the Bible to their culture in some way. Mm. And for me. I get out of this tonight, what I get out of it is I need to be more in my Bible and more studying it and listening to that and asking God how does that, how does the Bible and what it teaches relate to today. But I need to be in the Bible, I need to be studying the Bible, I need to deal with the world, not on the world's terms, but on mm. Christ's terms. Yeah. You know, and I think today it's the other way around. I think the church is dealing, like you've said, the church is trying to deal with the world on the world's terms, with the world's resources. With the, but we're to do it the other way around. We're to do it on the way Christ wants us to do it. And I think yeah. I think we're losing it. We're losing that more and more. Yeah. I mean. What was the Great Commission? To go out to all the world, make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them everything. And it says, and afterwards, this is in Mark chapter 16. Oh, just, a, just a little note, if anyone tells you that last ending of Mark's not in Mark, I have a read of Dean Bergen on, on his paper, The Last Ending of Mark. Uh, just a little thought there, just in case anyone ever tells you that uh, The Last Ending of Mark's not in Mark, because that's become popular today. Um, but in Mark chapter six, 16 it says, And afterwards he appeared unto the eleven, and they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was arisen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. You know, and then it goes, And the sign shall follow them and believe in thy name and cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues and they shall take up serpents and if they drink any deadly thing it shall not hurt them and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover so then after the Lord had spoken unto them he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs and following Amen mm. but the great commission there was to go and preach the gospel. Um, and it was a that it was a spiritual commission. I mean, God, God blessed it. God saying He's going to bless it with signs. Mm -hmm. But they were to go out and preach that gospel. And, and um, 
I think in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, it says, um, Verse 12, for we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in art. For whether we beside ourselves, it is to God. For whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ compels us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, and that they which lived, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherein henceforth know ye, we no man after the flesh, yes, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, and hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation to which mm. that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and have committed unto the word of reconciliation then he says verse 20 now that we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God he that made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him so we're ambassadors mm. we're, we're not uh, we're not we're not culturally um, we're not princip we're not culturally fitter in us mm. we're ambassadors mm. 